Okay, uh, the last lecture we talked about the Swasha exterior solutions, which is uh, for Einstein field equation was the spherical symmetric source. Uh, the by exterior solution would mean find the metric uh, at every point outside the source. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk to geodesic in such a space time. And uh, we will discuss the, uh, the curved space-time leading to the deflection of light, and I'll also talk about precession of the planet Mercury's orbit in such a curved space. So we're first, going to talk about deflection of light. Uh, <coughs> the GI effect with this so far basis through equivalent principle. Uh, gravitational redshift and time dilation, so all relate to warping of space-time in the time direction. Okay. And geometry space and time on equal footing means if you have curves in time direction, you also should have a curve in the spatial direction. And this, in fact, is reflected in the co zero by is not equal to the flat space of minus one value. The GRR also deviates from the flat space value of one. So now, an observer using this coordinates, uh, time coordinate uh, distance to observe this light speed, okay, C defined to be dr dt, then it would differ from locally measured. Uh, distance and time, so therefore, which is universal C, d rho d tau, and uh, uh, and uh, now the proper time and the proper uh, distance are related to coordinate time, coordinate distance by this formula we talked about, basically some square root factor of metric elements. And uh, we have talked about solution. These metric elements are related to express in terms of the uh, Schwarzschild radius or in terms of the uh, gravitational potential for a spherical source. Uh, so the point, of course, is not only we have gravitational time dilation because uh, the tau is not equal to t, but it's modified by a gravitational potential factor. But also, we have a gravitational length contraction, means the proper length is not radial distance. Again, also modified by a, a, a gravitational potential factor. So that's the gravitational length contraction as implied by the Schwarzschild solution. So we talk about the coordinates uh, speed, uh, dr dt. Now, dr. Uh, is related to d rho over 1 minus, you know, so I moved this factor over, so d rho over uh, 1 minus phi over c squared. And the 1 over dt is equal to 1 plus phi over c squared divided by d tau. So I substitute these two relations into this expression for the speed in terms of coordinate distance and coordinate time. And of course, I can have d rho the tau term, which is C, and then I have this potential factor, which I can, since this is a small factor, I can put the denominator turn into numerator, so I get 1 plus 2 phi this over C squared, which is, is a, which deviates, this speed deviates from C twice as much, because uh, in the equivalent principle is phi over C squared, here, gr is 2 phi over c squared. And remember in our calculation, chapter 4, the deflection of angle, the light deflection angle, uh, delta phi, is directly proportional to this deviation. So now the deviation is trice, so therefore the deflection angle is trice. So the deflection angle called the gr will be trice the deflection angle of the equivalent principle, which is the factor 2 become 4. 4 gm c times minimal the radial distance. So, in other words, we have deflection angle by g this formula, the delta phi is given by here. 
So for light glazing past the surface of the sun, which means, of course, mass is solar mass, the R mean is simply the solar radius. If you plug this value in, you get a deflection angle uh, 1.74 arc second, which is uh, one four thousandths of the angular width of the sun. So it's not easy. It's, it's, it's deflection, so this is, but it's a small amount of deflection. It's not easy to detect. So you know, we, to all detect, we need a solar eclipse to uh, to shed out, to to block the light of the sun against a, also a background of several bright stars, so that some can be used as reference point. In May 29, 1919, there was such a, a solar eclipse predicted. So two British expeditions were organized by Eddington, one to the Sobra uh, in North Brazil, another to the uh, to the island of Principi off the coast of West Africa. And well, here's the path of the 19, uh, 19 solar eclipse. And uh, the Brazil and uh, the West Africa uh, location are marked here. Okay, so two expeditions were sent here to 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 observe this, how much a, this a solar light will be deflected. It was it will appear here, like by this angle. And of course, the success of this uh, uh, verification of the GR results by these solar eclipse results caused a worldwide sensation. Okay. And I said become instant celebrity. And here are the, some of the headlines, you know, revolution in science, new theory of the universe, Newtonian ideas overthrown. And the New York Times, I guess, have times askew in the heavens. Man of science more or less agog over the result of the eclipse observation. I said the triumphs. Uh, stars not where they seem or were calculated to be, but nobody needs to worry. <laughs> anyway, the reports Einstein predict were successful in these tests uh, create worse and partly because the scientific reasons and partly because the world was astonished that so soon after the Great War that the British should finance and conduct an expedition to test the theory proposed by a German citizen. Uh, let me make a comment about Eddington. Eddington was a Quaker conscientious objector, and with the astronomer Royal Dyson help, he was able to continue his research during the war. Okay, and then during uh, in 1916, uh, De Sitter in Holland was able to give uh, uh, was transmitted Einstein's paper uh, uh, to Eddington and. Uh, uh, so that's why Eddington in, uh, you know, the British Library was not able to receive anything from Germany, but Eddington was able to receive Isaac paper. And then he was uh, convinced the importance of persuaded the Royal Society, Astronomy Society to mount these uh, uh, eclipse observations. And you notice newspaper here is a book for 12 wise men. <coughs> Uh, no more in all the world could comprehend it, said Einstein, when his daring publisher accepted. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what started the, the, this hoopla saying this GR is so difficult, only a few persons in the world would ever understand it. <laughs> uh, the graphic deflection of light has some similarity to bending of light by glass lenses. So, you know, instead of you have uh, a source bent like this, uh, by uh, by gravitational mass, uh, if you had a glass lens here, you, you will also have a, a bending. So there's some, so that's all this, so we have called gravitational lensing effect. And also, this make it clear that uh, if the source is sufficiently far away, the light ray can go this way, or go the other way, so therefore you can create uh, double images. And in fact, if the light source is perfectly aligned, you can create a ring of images, okay, so called uh, uh, Einstein ring. Anyway, in general, we find uh, stretched images of light sources.
liking because liking uh, the, the lensing mass can ca cause the, the the source to bend in the in the in, in arc length. In the uh, here is an image of a uh, uh, a cluster of uh, uh, the, uh, the the distance uh, 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 source a uh, uh, gravity deflected into arc lenses by the, the cluster of uh, so you see all these in fact gravitational lensing has become a powerful tool for modern astronomy in mapping out astronomical mass distributions uh, in fact in all these so called lensing equations the key input is just uh, the deflection angle formula we derived then put it into the usual lens equation. You can uh, do detailed calculation to find out how much uh, a light will be bent. In cosmology, uh, the theoretical predictions are mostly in terms of mass distribution rather than distribution of stars and galaxies. So therefore, the lens equation are particularly useful because it directly relates to mass distributions. <coughs> In fact, we will discuss the case in the cosmology. That's the so-called the bullet cluster of galaxies. Uh, as evidence, the direct evidence for the presence of dark matter. And here, the Lancy effect is indispensable to find that if you have this hard mass distribution to ex to to show that, uh, this, there must be dark matter. And some of you even more spectacular case of uh, lensing, in fact, was published this year, uh, because you not only have multiple images, because the source can uh, can arrive at our telescope through different paths, so they may can take different amount of time. So, for example, in this case, uh, just recently observed uh, some distant source. In fact, turn into four images, so it's sometimes called Einstein cross, and uh, uh, but actually they calculate that it already appeared in uh, something like uh, uh, twenty years ago. Okay, and in fact they predict in another five uh, another five years, so there will be again it will be appearing this these images. So it's quite really spectacular the gravitational lensing effect. So that's end the first part of uh, lecture 15.